Daniel Strauss, so good to have you here today. Uh, Daniel is an inve- investor, entrepreneur and author. Um, his latest book was released this week, uh, Billionaire Career. Um, welcome, Daniel. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for joining me. I know it's been a very hectic week and you've got a busy, busy schedule with the launch. Uh, tell me about what you've been doing. Yeah, we've been having back-to-back interviews with television stations, radio stations, everyone. So, yeah, it's a great experience and, and I'm grateful for the support that we have from the media in general. Oh, fantastic. The reason why you're sitting in front of me is because of our relationship that we formed and that happened due to your first book. I read your first book, The Billionaire Mindset, and I was absolutely blown by your way of thinking. And I remembered putting down the book and I said to myself, I need to meet this guy. I need to just get some fresh perspective on business from him and um, just absorb your awesomeness, actually. And um, I struggled to get hold of you and I couldn't get an appointment and I couldn't find any seminars at that stage. You didn't, didn't have the seminars. So I scrolled through Google and I saw that you were a speaker at an Entrepreneur of the Year um, competition. And that's where I met you. And from there, the journey started. So um, I tried to get guests on my show that I can relate to and that actually made an impact on my life and in business and that has an impact on the, the greater good of this country and of the world so yeah so I just want to say well done I've met you well what was it three four years ago and you started your business from scratch and you built a great business um so I just want to congratulate on congratulate you on that thank you Daniel (laughs) from my side the new book tell me a little bit about it um why did you decide to do a follow-up so the new book is different from the first one in the sense that it is a story book. Um, what I, I got extremely good feedback on the first book and specifically related to the little stories that I told in order to convey very difficult business concepts. And because I got such positive feedback, I thought, okay, let me go all the way and create a character that would go through different ups and downs in business and then get guidance from mentors during this journey. So the reader can actually go on the journey with the main character and learn lessons through that. And so many people who've read the new book told me, wow, I I, I finally understand these concepts so much better because I was in the shoes of that character and and it really hit home. So I'm grateful for the fact that people appreciate this this writing style. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. I read it last night and um, I was blown away. As you said, I could relate to the character. And I think your writing style really eats, it eats your heart. Um, so the reason why you're here is also be, uh, partly because you're an entrepreneur. So tell me about your first business that you started. So my very first business was a vegetable garden on our farm when I was still in primary school (laughs) and I actually did everything myself. My dad said I must literally take the implements and do the physical labor myself. Um, So I had carrots, I had beetroot and I had onions that I would grow and then I would go and um, sell it at the green grocer in in town. (laughs) And from there? I also sold newspapers uh, during holidays um, in Artenbos when we were on holiday. So that taught me a lot about people. And especially I could predict what the size of my tip would be based on guess what? No, tell me. The shoes of the lady of the house. So a guy could have a very, um, like a, a brand new car in front, um, and I, I, that couldn't tell me whether he's gonna was gonna tip me or not. But if the lady of the house had very clean, nice, well looked after shoes, I got big tips. I don't know why, but that's what <laughs> I found. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Lesson learned. Yeah. <laughs> Look at shoes. <you. laughs> 
So as as all of us know, business is not always easy. And um, tell me about one of your most epic failures as a business entrepreneur. So I've had a few. Um, I think one thing would have been, you know, I've got these seminars and you've been there and it is a massive success now. I've got all these people there. Everybody loves it. But the first one that we did, I couldn't sell any tickets because I didn't have a funnel. I didn't have a proper funnel through which people could come, get to know us, trust us, understand that this is legitimate and then buy the tickets. So the first one, I I think I sold five tickets. But you know what? I still went forward. Did the seminar, lost the money. Um, At least those five people got amazing results and a lot of value. (laughs) And that was actually quite recent. Um, And now they sold out months before before I do them. But it's because lesson learned, build a proper funnel and, and make sure that you build that trust long before the event. I think the biggest mistake that we make as as entrepreneurs is we want to go from meeting a girl to wedding uh, to, to the wedding in two days, and there's a whole courtship that needs to happen, and um, this really relates to that part of business issues that you that you have. Um, when I speak to young entrepreneurs, I I have this conversation when I say, uh, "What's your funnel?" and most of them will look at me like this. And um, once you start exp- explaining to them, it's like a dating. You have to meet her, take her number, start chatting, and go through the whole thing before you, you get married. Um, I think then they get it. So it's good to know that even in your as a mature entrepreneur, we, we also make the mistakes. Yeah, but I, I think it's because I went into a whole new uh, industry where I wasn't before. So, I mean, the other industries that I really understand well – I would never make those mistakes, but it's when we move into new industries, you're actually a new entrepreneur again, and you're not as as mature as you would call it because, yeah, you make the mistakes. In South Africa, we have various issues at the moment plaguing us, um, load shedding, um, economic growth, inflation, and the shrinking middle class. Um, How do you hedge yourself against that in business? And um, how does your business thrive and grow from here? in this economic environment? So the strange thing about entrepreneurial training and investing in entrepreneurs, those industries actually boom when times are tough. So maybe just to give you some background on why I'm doing all these training and writing the books and all of these things, my core business is investing in businesses that's what I do that's my core business but what's the biggest challenge of an investor venture capital investor or private equity investor is finding good businesses and good people to invest in combination is it's hard to find so I realized that I don't have time to drink coffee with a thousand entrepreneurs every quarter it's physically impossible and I actually love my wife and my kids and I want to spend time with them and I don't I can't drink coffee with everyone so I thought okay how can I do this so I have these webinars where there's about a thousand people on a webinar then I have master classes there's about 450 people at a master class and then I've got the seminars maximum of 70 people at the seminars and then we've got the mentorship sessions which is about 10 to 12 people in a mentorship program. And once people have come through that, I would normally choose one entrepreneur, let's say out of a thousand, to invest in. So what happened is I met all of these people or they had interaction with me in, in some form. And then I also get to know them because the mentorships are quite interactive, the seminars are quite interactive. And by the time that I choose someone to invest in, I, I've got quite a good idea of the business and the person by that time. So that's the, and along the journey, all the people who we don't invest in still get significant value and still grow their businesses significantly if they get the value from that. For instance, there's one successful entrepreneur, 20 years in business, grew his um, turnover in, by 38% in three months. I think you met the guy at one of the seminars. 
people like that, I mean, to grow 38% after 20 years still in three months is, is significant. And I probably won't invest in his business just because he values different things. He doesn't necessarily want to grow to a, a billion uh, um, rand or dollar business. He literally just wants to run his business, look after his family, be a good entrepreneur. Um, so those people, it's great to see that they also get value and they also grow. Hmm. You, uh, you talk about the hula hoop and the tea light candle businesses um, at the seminar. So tell me more about it. Um, I think it's a very interesting concept that everyone should hear. Yeah, I think especially in the current economic environment, it's very important to focus on cash flow first. And there's a lot of people who think they read some Silicon Valley blogs and then they think, no, you must be the next Facebook or the next Uber or the next this. But in a emerging market conte uh, context, you actually just need cash flow first. You must survive before you thrive, not the other way around. And we play this little game where we put the hula hoop the um, paper plate and the tea light candle there and people can choose which ones they throw at. And I mean, you've seen it. Most people choose to throw <laughs> at the tea light candle tea first. Light. Yeah, because you, your, your have value is higher on the tea light. It's a thousand rand every time you heat it. Yeah, I think it's a hundred <laughs> rand on the tea light and ten rand on the uh, paper plate and one rand on the <laughs> hula hoop. But I suggest that you go for the hula hoop first. Make sure that you just get that cash flow that's ticking, 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 ticking. You can always go for the other ones later on, but you need your strong foundation first before you can really go for the sh for the moon. Yeah, for the niche market, yeah. actually. That brings me to, uh, to my next question. Uh, whilst working smart and not hard, the movement has been diluted by the rise of the four-day workweek movement. Um, has such a big effect on people where they actually now work less and not even harder and they don't work anymore. That's what I find. Um, I think most of them are going for the tea light business, it seems. Um, how do you feel about that? I think it depends on your definition of success. So you are a very ambitious person. You want to grow a big business and you want to make a lot of money. Of course. But some people, we always say... Let's say, and I think I did, did this in the seminar as well, but let me ask you in any case. Which one do you choose? A Ferrari or a Land Cruiser? Both. Oh, right. <laughs> no, I, I would like the Land Cruiser. Yeah, so, you, <laughs> so some people value sophistication and some people value practicality. And in the same way, so let's say I go to a farmer in the Kalahari won't be able to do anything with a Ferrari on the gravel roads. He needs the Land Cruiser mm. to be able to drive on those bad roads. The same way, so he would say the Land Cruiser is good. He might say the Ferrari is beautiful, but if I have to he has to choose which one is good, he'll choose good for him is the Land Cruiser. In the same way, people define good businesses in different ways. Some people say some a business with great cash flow has um is good another one doesn't need cash flow it just needs to build shareholder value that's good someone else if i can work from home it's good someone else if i can only work four hours a week and still get by that's good so we have to be cognizant of the fact that our definitions of good differ and for that reason i won't judge someone working four hours a week if they are happy with their lifestyle and what they get out of that, but you're unlikely to really become extremely wealthy if you start out like that. Later on, if you have this, the teams and the systems and everything in place, you may be able to work less than four hours a week and still make a lot of money, but you need to build that foundation first. In your first book, you wrote about the different hats that entrepreneurs put on. Tell me about two of the hats that you focus on. So I focus on the shareholder hat and the director hat most of the time because the companies that we invest in have someone who's wearing the, the um, CEO hat. So as a shareholder and as a director, I normally have a different perspective on how the business should grow and should expand because 
we think in terms of a place where everything is possible because we say above the line everything is possible and below the line only the budget is possible. How many businesses do you invest in? Or are you invested in at the moment? So we've invested in about 80 businesses, 80 um, up until this point. Um, obviously, we've exited some of them. So I'll have to check to see <laughs> how many. <laughs> but around about 80 in total. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're in a partnership? Yes. Tell yeah. me more about your partner. He is an absolute angel of a human being we've been business partners for more than 11 years now um, and yeah he's just a great guy to work with extremely smart um, extremely hard working um, he's better at the the tech companies if I can say let's like, say very high tech technology content and I'm more I'm better at the traditional businesses um, so we complement each other. So we have a saying that um, a partnership is a, a sinking ship. How do you make it work? How do you make a partnership work in this day and age? Uh, so we normally say that your frame of reference consists of three things. It's the books you read, the mentors you had, and your own experience. So I'm sure the person who came up with that saying had a different frame of reference than I mm. have. Because, I mean, if you look at the most successful listed companies in South Africa, most of them work some kind of partnership initially, even if it was just by raising equity funding from an investor, that then becomes a form of a partnership as well. So um, me and my partner, we were very aligned with our aspirations and our view of building businesses from the very start. Um, in the South African context, a lot of private equity investors um, used, as we say, the stick approach. So they would squeeze blood out of a stone and, and almost force the entrepreneurs to grow through fear. Now, we think people behave better when you help them to grow through support and supporting their aspirations, the carrot approach instead of the stick approach. So from the first day, we were both disgusted with the stick approach and the bullying of entrepreneurs that were happening in the market, and we decided that we are going to do it differently. And that was the core principle that actually drove us um, and kept us together and, and made it a great partnership. That's amazing. I know you personally and you are also one of the most wonderful people that I've ever met. Uh, your integrity level, you're just one amazing person, really. Um, I've never met a businessman that is so direct but so helpful at the same time. And um, I thank you for that part that you play in my life. Um, as a mentor, uh, you, as I say, as a mentor, you, you're very... Um, you influence me on a positive level, and I know you're very passionate about mentorship. Um, I also think that it's it's needed in this country that that we stand up and, and mentor the younger generation. Yes, thank you. So we always try to say that we are not a shark tank; we are a dolphin pool. So <laughs> we are friendly with the entrepreneurs. Why well, I've never seen the the need or the the value in um, degrading someone who wants to raise funding from you or, or trying to make someone's life difficult who's simply just trying to build their businesses. I, I can't see the reason why. They need support. They don't need to be uh, pushed into the ground. And I think that's our whole approach. Let's talk about positives and negatives of social media and the entrepreneurial mind. It's easy to get both inspired and demotivated by the look at me trend. Um, of success stories currently in the social social media? Yeah, I think I haven't really come across that because I don't follow look at me people really. <laughs> you are the look at me no. people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll never post anything that I think could give the impression that we are wealthy on social media and I think you, um, you, 
if you've seen anything like that, please show it to me because I, I don't want it there. Mm. Because I think in a society like ours, um, while it may get you customers for whatever reason, I don't think that is the right um, message that we want to send into the world. We want to say, okay, entrepreneurship is hard, but it's possible. Um, and here's a few uh, pro proven methods to grow your own business instead of uh, being in front. So actually, um, maybe I can tell you, I'm, I'm going to do this. I haven't done it yet, okay. but I'm looking for a very nice Lamborghini. Okay. Um, so I can take a picture with me on the Lamborghini, but a Lamborghini track tractor okay. not a Lamborghini car to make it clear that I'm also in a Lamborghini but it's a Lamborghini tractor so I can work on my farm with it you understand it's a different approach because why would you be flashy I, I can't see a, a, yeah, any value in being flashy uh, when when I look at your social media as well as your wife's Relines, it's very wholesome and it's um, it's helpful and it inspires um, which is it's a positive influence on people but you do get the other accounts that breaks you down you look at it and you think I can never do that I can never be that happy I can never you know be that person and um, that that does motivate but yes I think the best solution is not to follow them um, I think both Rolene and I what we try to do is to be real we want to be real on social media and say you know what this is what we're doing this is what's working not everything we do do work either we also have our failures and uh, I, I can't pretend to be something that I'm not so tell me if, um, what is your advice at new entrepreneurs how do you plan build start a business up to the end what is your winning recipe you might not like my answer but the challenge is that entrepreneurial advice is one of the most difficult things to do because people are in different stages of their growth as an entrepreneur. That's why I say that if you're looking for a mentor, look for someone who has achieved success in your field, but who's only two or three or four steps ahead of you, not the person that's 30 steps ahead of you and the number one in the industry because they might give you the wrong advice. So my best advice for entrepreneurs who are starting out it's cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Make sure that you have something that makes money from day one and then you can grow from there. Because a lot of the advice out there is go big or go home and in most cases you go home then because it's not easy in an in a emerging market context to get the type of capital that can keep you alive if you don't have the, the fundamentals right the product market fit right immediately. Um, why is mentorship so important to you? Because I do know you also have mentors. So to me, if you play computer games, it's like a cheat code, a mentor. It's like he can tell you or she can tell you what to do before you make the mistake. And then you don't have to make the mistake and you just go forward much quicker. So I wouldn't have been at the level where I am now if it wasn't for mentors who taught me how to navigate all the difficulties of entrepreneurship up, up until now. And because mentorship played such a massive role in, in my personal success, to me it's the biggest difference between someone who's made, who will make it and someone who don't is, is the quality of your mentors really. Most entrepreneurs have big dreams and big ideas. That's why they call themselves entrepreneurs. Um, but like Stephen Covey writes, most business failures begin the first creation with problems such as undercapitalization, misunderstanding of the market, or a lack of a business plan. Could you shine a light on that for us? I think one of the most important things that you have to do as an entrepreneur is you have to plan to fail from day one. So what will happen if this goes wrong and will I still be able to survive in a business if these two or three or four things go wrong so I personally um, define risk as 
the influence of uncertainty on an objective. So number one, you have to have a very clear objective. If you don't have an objective, it is the biggest risk that you can take. So where do you want to be in three to five years from now? Have absolute clarity about that. And then you have to go and see, okay, what are the highest impact, lowest cost or lowest effort things that I can do first in order to get to that point? And, I mean, if you cannot build your business without external funding in an emerging market, it will be a challenge. Or at least if you can get a seed funding round and then at least survive from there, then you have a big chance of success. But if you are only going to break even in four years from now after your seventh round of funding, the chances that you will be able to survive in an emerging market is very, very low. Then you should rather go and start your business in a developed market. Um, in an emerging market, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow from day one. And, and that's all I can really say about this. Our current economical environment in South Africa is very difficult. How do you keep a positive attitude and make a success of your different ventures? If you look at South Africa, up to 60% of all job opportunities or all jobs are sustained by small and medium enterprises. In the US, two-thirds of all new jobs are created by small businesses. In the European Union, 85% of all new jobs are created by small businesses. So the only way that we can solve our biggest challenge in the country, which is unemployment, is by supporting entrepreneurs and helping them to grow their businesses. Um, so, yes, it's a challenging environment, but that also creates opportunities, a lot of opportunities. And we just have to be cognizant of all the opportunity, opportunities around us. And, and you know, the, the difference between South Africa and developed nations is our competition is so much um, lower than in developed countries. If you start a business there, you've got 10 people competing. Over here, you may have three or four. So just improving your service level is a differentiator. You don't have to create a new patent and come up with a new product. You can literally go into a new or, or in, into an existing industry and just provide a better service. And you're likely to win in that industry in the, in the medium and the long term. So there's so many different ways that you can look at opportunities in South Africa. And I'm extremely positive about the country. Not going anywhere because my wife and I decided just before the lockdowns, okay, we're either going to go abroad or we're going to stay. We made the decision to stay and then we said, okay, if we decide to stay, we are never allowed to complain about anything again. We are either part of the solution or we have to leave. And now we have to be part of the solution. That's why I'm writing the books doing the seminars, investing in entrepreneurs, helping them to grow, doing whatever we can in order to, to reduce unemployment. Because once we do that, the country changes. Um, Daniel, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate the effort that you put in to be here. I know it was very difficult to, to find the space to just to be part of my journey as well. And I really look forward on um, the journey that we've got together in the future. Thanks so much, Alita, and all the best.